Welcome, and thanks for joining us. Moss Adams is pleased to present another in our ongoing series of continuing professional education webcasts. Our presentation will start in a few moments. Before we begin, here are a few things to keep in mind. You can customize how you both view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can also adjust window size and placement. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons, each relating to a different aspect of our session. For example, you can click the file folder icon to download the group attendance sheet and a PDF copy of today's slides. You can ask our presenter questions during the webcast by clicking Q&A in the bottom left-hand portion of the icon bar and typing in your question. We'll do our best to answer all questions during the presentation or follow up via email. We'll ask polling questions throughout today's presentation. Per the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy webcast CPE standards, CPE credit will be awarded based on your participation in these polls. To respond to a poll, click the button next to your answer. If you're attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our attendance sheet to receive CPE credit. Please have all group members sign the sheet, and please remit only one sheet per group. Also note, today's session will offer you one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the requirements as specified by the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of the polling questions. CPE credit can be awarded only to participants registered as themselves and is not available to participants who view the on-demand version. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon to open a PDF file you can save to your computer. As a reminder, the presentation you're about to see is not legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. We're now ready to begin. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to today's webcast, The Future of Retail. Are you prepared? We have three great speakers from Moss Adams joining us today, Frank Kaufman, Francis Tam, and Darren Gaynor. Frank, I will now turn the line over to you to begin today's presentation. Great. Thanks, Emily. As you can see, we've got the agenda so we can go quickly through what we're going to cover today. And you'll see a very common theme. First topic retail, the next tech company, and then what's new with, with respect to innovative retail products, uh, a fairly lengthy and important section on cybersecurity, omni-channel, which is something that's been present and evolving, as well as uh, what's going on in the digital world. I think we've already received some questions from people on the line about the brick and mortar global expansion, then we'll talk about our retail marketing strategies and then where we think the future is heading. So first section, the new tech company, this, uh, the things that we're seeing. For one, a mobile app is at this point getting to be mandatory uh, operating procedure for anybody in the retail world. Whether you have uh, a chain of stores, or you're going direct pure play, this has got to be a key to your strategy. In that app, you certainly can build a culture. You can use the information that's coming in from that app to learn much more about your customer and push things out to them. Uh, the analytics of mobile and location to suck people into your store if you're in a mall are very powerful. And when you, when you come to um, just overall, it's a different world. Here are some of the apps that we've seen that we think are, if you haven't downloaded these, use these, or um, even just experimented and, and used uh, some of the ideas that have come up for your retail uh, chain, then you should. So one, one, some of them that we like particularly Walgreens, Walmart, and Home Depot. And uh, 
I don't know, one I think is really engaging is, is Target's uh, Cartwheel app. And if you go on there, it's pretty fun because you can get discounts on any category from back to school to Halloween. You, you put the discounts on your phone. You can scan things as you're in the store. And then you just walk up to the register and save literally millions of dollars. I think if you go on the Target Cartwheel site, you will see that they keep track daily of how much has been saved by Target customers, and it's approaching $300 million by using the discounts that are through this app. And really, you know, obviously it's, it's saving money for the customer. The retailer is, in one sense, you could say you're losing money, but not really. You, you can correlate the use of the apps, and what happens is the more times you use uh, this application at Target, you get additional points, and it just builds customer loyalty like no other. It's, it's really pretty incredible. And, and beyond the apps, let's talk about actually how people are buying now, and, and you can see various choices, and we're going to poll you guys in just a minute about what you want. And what we found, if you look at the big peak for last year in the holiday, uh, buying online and picking up in the store was, was just exploding. And maybe it's because there are people like me that are procrastinators and wait till the end and say, hey, I want, I want to go online, but oh my gosh, I can't even wait the overnight that Amazon uh, is able to deliver in. So what that means for retail is a challenge, and I think Darren will talk a little bit later in the omni-channel world of how to have systems that can interact with the digital and the brick and mortar world. So I think if we go here, you'll see our, our next polling question that talks about these. And I guess Emily, why don't you walk through what we're trying to learn here. Sure. Our first polling question is, which of the following methods do you currently employ? You may select more than one option here, and the options are buy online, pick up in store, buy online, ship from store, same day delivery, or no e-commerce option. To participate in the polls, please click the button next to the answer you choose and hit submit. And as a reminder, you can select more than one for this first polling question. I'll give everyone a few more moments. And let's take a look at the results. And it looks like our results are 40% buy online pick up in store, 62% buy online ship from store, about 18% same day delivery, and 18% with no e-commerce option. Yeah, so that, Mike, that's... Back. Oh yeah, Emily, that's, that's very interesting. I, I think uh, clearly from what we've seen in the stats uh, looking at prior year, the buy online uh, numbers continue to trend up. Those are probably each about 10, 15 points higher than they were just a couple years ago. I am a little bit surprised that still there is close to 20% that do not have an e-commerce option. and. You know, I'd, I'd love to hear some comments through the Q&A maybe as to what the challenges are with e-commerce because across the board with the retailers that we represent, this is clearly the fastest growing uh, sales category is, is really through the digital channel. So, And I, I would also say that the same day delivery will be a number that we're going to see kick up. Again, it's really a market factor that's challenging everybody and and so if the consumer wants same-day delivery and, you know, unless you have DCs all over the place, you really have to think of your store as the local DC, and that gets you the most efficient and uh, timely option to get customers their products same day without uh, absorbing too much cost. As you know, most people are wanting shipping for free at this point. So here's an interesting uh, slide, and, and 
something that gives you an idea of by category, the, the baby boomers versus the millennials, uh, the delivery methods. So assuming that you have the ability to have your customer buy online and pick up in your store, this addresses how do they want to pick up the product. Okay, And what's, what's interesting and maybe not surprising is what's the most efficient, easiest. So you can see if, if you are able to drive through and pick up the store, you know, maybe think of, uh, you know, Walgreens and, and uh, the pharmacy pickup and you drive through and that's a piece of cake. Well, if you, you expand that to all your product line uh, in this busy, you know, time-strained world, what people expect is to go faster. And, and in each case, in each column, you can see the boomers are lower as far as their expectations of convenience than the millennials. And what what we'd expect to see is that, you know, this isn't just a pocket of a generation, but it's really a trend of expectation. So uh, the, the younger, as, as the millennials move out and the next group takes over, these are going to be even higher. So what, what I also see from the, um, what you have here on the uh, combined kiosk, which is very interesting. So you can go and have your mall purchases consolidated. And so you know, avoiding the, the traffic, the long lines going into each and every store, it's all about convenience. And you see clearly, although the millennials are higher than the boomers on the locker concept of, okay, well, you load it up for me and I get out and go get it, that's not the preferred method. That's a delivery of product. Now we're going to talk a, a little bit about uh, the buying power. You see there these millennials that we need to pay attention to, 1.4 trillion. It's all about convenience. And then the other thing it talks about is fun and optimism and joy. And so in addition to how you service the customer, we're seeing some really cool products that are, are making an impact and, and getting quite a strong following. So we'll move on to those. So here, here you go. I don't know how many people are dog lovers or have dogs, uh, but if you have a dog and you want to go away, there's always a challenge. How am I going to, who's going to watch my dog? Am I taking my dog with me? Am I bordering? Up? So you have this thing, pet chats, and what happens is you have a, a literally like an iPad type screen on your wall uh, with, attached to this container that mounts on the wall. And you can, your face will show up there. You can call your dog over. You can actually see your dog through the camera. And you can um, push a button and have the dog food fall into the bowl. And it's, it's an incredible product. And it's just uh, one more step in technology that is making our lives easier. So another one, Happy Fork, which I need to employ that, which gives you a communication as you're eating with this fork if you're eating too fast and slow down. Here's another cool product if anybody's used the Tunity app. But what that does is you put an app on your smartphone and you may listen to a show that's being it's on a TV screen. Think in terms of if you're at an airport and it, you know, you're a little bit far away, you can't hear it, you can't sit next to that, the Tune of the App will pick up the volume. And if you are at a gym and you're going from machine to machine and you can have that app and the phone and put your own earphones in and you don't have to be hooked into each machine to hear what's going on. There's another kind of a, we always want to be a little bit far out there. So the secret is something that I would encourage all of you at least to go to their website. The product exists in, in the prototype form. And you can see a YouTube video. It's pretty cool. But instead of having a phone, you have a wristband that actually is submersible in water. And uh, you can have the screen of your phone projected onto your arm, let's say. And you can actually read emails by scrolling 
by touching your your skin. There's actually no phone there. It's it's sort of uh, the wave of the future. Uh, they're raising money. If anyone jumps on that bandwagon, but it's just presented here as an idea of what all of you in the retail world should be thinking about as you're moving forward in uh, trying to keep your consumers happy. And as you move forward and as you're chasing uh, the technology that there's some other health-related products, right? Wearable gear, not brand new, um, been around for a bit. Uh, but it is uh, driving or feeding, I should say, a health-conscious need that's going on in the country at this point. And something that I haven't seen too much of, well, we're, we're seeing just starts of this, but there's a lot of applications. I don't know if anybody on the... Uh, I, in fact, there are some people on the call here that are uh, grocers. And if you think in terms of one of your biggest costs, it's spoilage and also... Uh, the product cost to get product delivered to you. So what's popping up now are these urban barns where you're growing produce, uh, legal in all states, I should say, produce, uh, that is being grown in warehouses inside cities. And therefore, you can translate the product to the local grocers much quicker. So you save on spoilage, you save on freight. It's kind of innovative steps. Uh, before, I'll, I'll just comment this. With all this technology going on, you need to be conscious of the people that are using the technology to get into your systems. And so at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Francis Tan, who will take us through our cybersecurity section. Thanks, Frank. So I think those are all good uh, ideas from Frank. Uh, as you can tell, because of all the convenience people are offering, it opens up a new can of worms because now we are offering a lot of information, maybe on your portable devices, maybe on your laptops, maybe on your mobile apps. And there are, there's, all, so, there's so many ways information can go in and out of your company. So that's a, a new topic that we have been hearing uh, in the last few years, uh, cybersecurity. So as you can imagine, because of this, some of the bad guys, the hackers are taking advantage of this, of the information you, your customers are providing you and what you're providing to your maybe third parties, your customers to enhance your business. Uh, some of the numbers here, you know, uh, I don't know if this is all comprehensive and including everything, but uh, $3.5 trillion of fraudulent transactions per year. I think that's a probably a very conservative estimate. 80% of customers are a victim of fraud. So I'm sure many of you have got a phone call from your credit card company and say, hey, your card has been uh, compromised. We need to issue you a new card. That's what happens. 13.1 uh, million average number of identity thefts in the U.S. each year. So you can tell there's so many things that so, many, so much information you, you have that is very profitable for the hackers. Credit card information, identity, identity information, financial information, healthcare information, even some of the trade secrets you may have, they are all worth a lot of money. So, you know, I don't need to go through a lot of these hacks, uh, well-known ones for the last few years. Target, Home Depot, Neiman Marcus, these are all well-known. What happened there? Well, you know, this is why we need to look at this cybersecurity because the convenience they're offering, the, 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 the you know, how make it so much easy for people to buy, the consumers to buy. That's why we need to look at cybersecurity. State of the affairs, major spending on security, but industry is still losing ground. Um, I think many of you know that uh, a lot of people, I'm talking about hackers, uh, are full-time people. They could be state-sponsored. They could be, could be organized crime. They could be a lot of people that are banding together to do something. So there are a lot of people trying to get into your world to get your information that you have. Point perimeter solutions are expensive and difficult to keep up. So in my world, in the IT world, a lot of the solutions right now, they are state-of-the-art, very expensive. They manage to keep certain people out, but then within a few weeks, they could be obsolete if you don't keep it up. So in our world, uh, a, a word that's very famous is patching. You know, how soon can you patch up your firewall? How soon can you patch up your antivirus? Those are the definitions you pretty much have your IT guys, hey, focus and make sure you get the latest and greatest because whatever you know today probably will become obsolete. Somebody will find a, a way to exploit it in a week or two. Um, 
So the last bullet here, uh, everybody has heard about this PCI, the EMV. PCI stands for Payment Card Industry, and EMV is a new chip. They roll out Pay MasterCard Visa chip. It's a chip sitting on your card. It has not been there for probably ever in the U.S., but it has been used by the European market and the Asian market for the longest time. And this is mainly due to, well, you know what, in the past few years, there's a lot of card frauds. A lot of people are stealing card numbers and cloning these cards. So the, ban, the, the banks and the card brands band together and say, hey, let's do something and see if we can make these cards harder to clone. And that's why they roll out the EMV chip. Next slide here. So um, this is a big thing because a lot of our audience here is in retail, so I'm sure you have a POS system, point of sale system. You have other ways you take credit cards in. You may have gift shop. You may have online uh, uh, purchasing ability that you offer to your customers, and most of the time they use credit cards to buy stuff. So that's why this Europay thing is very big in a lot of your mind. Um, as I mentioned, the EMV chip, is a way to uh, minimize, I wouldn't say entirely getting rid of uh, cloning cards, but it will be minimizing the cloning cards part. It has a secret cryptographic key in, embedded in it, and whenever you push it in, it does a two-way communication with the, uh, with the card brand and see, are you really the holder of this card? So this is a new way to enhance the security of these cards in the old way, the magnetic strip, that doesn't do any good anymore. It's very easy to clone. Uh, as long as you get a card, there are all kinds of devices you can get, all kinds of software you can get to clone these cards. So in, in, in the past, most of the card present, counterfeit card losses are the responsibility of the banks that issue the cards. Uh, that's no longer going to be true. After October 1st of this year, the merchants have to have the responsibility to uh, adopt the POS systems, for example, to, to be able to read these EMV chip cards. If they do not, they will be assuming their liability if they have a breach, if they prove it to the point that, oh, it's coming back to the POS system. The merchants will assume a certain uh, amount of liability. Is it 100%? Is it 50%? I think that will be litigated if uh, when it comes to that point. But but what the, the card brands and banks are wanting to say is if you do not have a device that can read the EMV chip, you are going to assume, if not all, part of the liability of the fraud. Okay. So as you can imagine, now the merchants have to decide, do they want to invest in the proper POS systems to be able to read and transmit the EMV information? If they don't, they will have to assume part of the liability, as I mentioned. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Emily, to go over our next polling question. Great. Thanks, Francis. The second polling question for today is, is your company prepared to implement the EMV compliance standards by the October 1st, 2015 deadline? And your options are, we are fully implemented, we are in process with implementation and expect it to be complete by October 1st, 2015, we expect to be fully compliant in 2016, or we do not currently have plans to comply. I'll give everybody a moment to respond. As a reminder, if you would like to earn CPE credit for today's webcast, you will need to respond to at least three of the four polling questions. And I'll close it in three, two, one, and let's take a look at the results. So 30% say they are fully implemented, 19% are in process with implementation and expect it to be complete by the October 1st deadline, 27% expect to be fully compliant in 2016, and 25% do not currently have plans to comply. That's good to know. So as you can imagine, not everybody's ready for the October 1st uh, deadline here. Um, so for those who are not ready, so you may want to consider the maybe the financial or legal uh, ramifications coming out of it. Um, it's, it's one thing they are pushing to the uh, merchants or the payment processes to be more compliant with. Okay, uh, so with that, well, you know, when there's a way, there's always a means to, to beat it. So the hackers have already come out with some certain ways to beat these uh, EMV chips, as you can imagine. 
So some of the hackers have already gone to, hey, I can get some cards. Maybe I cannot even clone the cards and you know present it in in, in person. So a lot of these guys have moved to the card not present or e-commerce rim, and so that they don't have to be face to face. They don't have to go face to face with the merchants. So this is still true. So when a person can somehow get a card number, the PAN, the primary account number, and the CVV, they can still go to, for example, pick up a telephone and order something, or go to an e-commerce site to buy things, because that is still all they need to be able to purchase things. So that's one way to defeat it. And then, of course, now the banks or the payment processors have found a way to say, well, even if you don't do face-to-face, I, I, they will find, they found a way to how they can be defeated or come, you know, uh, compensate for it. The extra layer of authentication you might have seen is they will say, well, in order for you to close this transaction, they'll send you a text message or they will send you somehow maybe a a uh, email and say, hey, here's a code for you to complete that transaction. So it's an extra step for them, for the consumers to close out, to execute the transaction, to make sure that the card holders are really the card holders of that card. But as you can imagine, that takes away the convenience, some of the easiness of executing a transaction. Do you want it? Well, you have to look at the costs and the benefits. You want convenience to trump security, or do you want to have a balance between the two? That's something you have to consider in your e-commerce model, your card not present, uh, uh, not present uh, transactions. So, so in this call, in this uh, webcast, I don't think uh, I can kind of go through all the components, uh, framework of how you can manage your cybersecurity uh, uh, you know, framework. But there are six bullets that we always go by when it comes to building a cybersecurity framework. People, process, policy, technology, monitoring, governance. People is always the weakest link because they're not robots, they cannot be programmed, but you want to make sure that they have enough security awareness training, uh, education, and make sure that's in the culture that they're not going to pass any sensitive, sensitive information to anybody who is asking for it. So this is one thing that uh, people are doing a lot, these hackers, email phishing, phone call phishing, walk-in to see what they can steal. You know, I think I saw some number released last week. Email phishing alone is a $1.2 billion business just by doing email phishing. Okay. Process. You want to make sure all the, form, all the processes are uh, formalized. People know what they have to follow. They don't have to guess or they don't have to interpret using their own discretion. Hey, you've got to have standard operating procedures, software development, life cycle, change management, all these good stuff, all the good stuff, what I call good IT hygiene. You want to follow that to make sure your people are following that. Policies. Again, you want to have formalized policies and procedures. Everything is in writing. People uh, would know how to, A, what is acceptable use, what is a good uh, uh, etiquette for email security? Uh, if you allow your customers or your employees to bring your, their own devices, what kind of policies do you need them to follow? All these good stuff, you need to make sure they are in writing because people may, you know, if I read it, you read it, we, we may have different interpretations of uh, the policies. Technology-wise, I mentioned before, you've got to have different layers, and whatever you have today may be obsolete within a week, a month, or even a year. So you've got to make sure that you have all the right stuff to provide as many layers of security as possible to protect all the sensitive information you touch on. Card information is a good one. People are always looking for it. Uh, identity information, trade secrets, all of the above. Uh, firewalls is a big, big thing. You know, this is a front, front line, the, the, the wall dividing your company from the outside world. So you want to make sure your IT people would have the state-of-the-art firewalls, would have the latest and greatest definitions of the firewall rules so that they know, okay, what I need to block, what I don't cannot block. Network design, encryption, system alerting, all of the above, you have to make sure that these are all practiced in your, in your environment. Monitoring, even if you have the best technology, if you do not do ongoing review and risk assessment, it's not good. You need to know where your risks are. You need to know where your sensitive information is so that you can protect them accordingly. Governance. 
tone at the top is very key. Um, I've been to so many companies that, well, they want to do an audit, but they only want an audit report. But they don't really care for about they, – they're only going for the compliance, but they're not really going for the security. So that's not good. You want to make sure that the tone at the top to preach to everybody, hey, guys, we need to protect our information, our client's information, because this is so key to the thriving of your business. Imagine if you have a leak, you have a go on TV – that's not good uh, publicity you want to get. Cybersecurity insurance, that's a big thing. Uh, in the last few years, uh, everybody's looking into it. How can you protect your, yourself uh, from an insurance pers perspective? Make sure you read all the fine prints. Not those only two words, cybersecurity insurance would be good enough. You have to make sure the fine prints say, hey, they will insure against certain events, malware, Trojan horse, breach. What kind of events are they, are, they, are they insuring you against? So you want to make sure those are all listed. You want to make sure you have all the scenarios covered. Okay. Um, so be prepared. There's no other ways that you can go around it. You have to know where your, all your sensitive data resides. Be, be aware of all how information gets in, how they get out, how they are being exposed to the, to the outside world. Uh, man manage all the risks, identify the threats and vulnerabilities, assess existing security measures, determine likelihood, impacts, and residual risks. Um, for most of the folks here, they, you probably are not re regulated, are not examined by anybody, but there are a lot of different frameworks you can go by, PCI, uh, NIST, National Institute of Standards of Technology, uh, OWASP, all kind of uh, IT standards you can go by, but they all kind of boil down to how you can protect your environment. Uh, expand pre prevention measures, establish response plans, that's a key. Do you have an incident response plan? Um, so that's something you want to make sure you have it in place because if you're not, you don't know how to react. Your people may not know how to react in case of a breach. What kind of breach can you define as scenarios? Is it just an email? Is it a comprehensive, pervasive breach? So you want to define all the, all the scenarios. You want to define the responses. So that's a very big thing that you need to consider. Be aware of breach notification requirements. So this is a, also a big thing. Depending on the state you operate in, there are state laws that require you how you need to or what you need to disclose to your customers in case you have a breach. If you do not do that, you're violated, violating some state laws or even federal laws. So the last piece of this uh, cybersecurity framework is you have to know the process flow of all your critical and sensitive data. Apply all the best practice frameworks to the best of your knowledge and make sure you update it. Again, you know what we do today probably is no good by the time 2016 rolls around. The hackers are always kind of updating the tools and methodology, how to get into your environment. So you need to make sure you update it, uh, the framework. Educate your workforce about data security. Require data security agreements with third-party business partner, partners. This is a very big thing because you may not be the only ones touching your customer information, especially when you're using a lot of third parties. In this case, I think a lot of you are using cloud providers, so be aware of these cloud providers. What is behind the cloud? What do they do? What are they doing in terms of protecting your information? Don't just assume, hey, it must be a big name. It is a big name. They must be good. You have a report, good enough. Not really, because you don't know what they are doing. They could be using another fourth party, fifth party, sixth party to, to process you and touch your information. So you want to make sure you do your due diligence and make sure who are the people touching your, your sensitive information. Uh, the last point is make sure you conduct periodic risk review, including penetration testing. So as your IT people may tell you, the second you plug into the Internet, probably you get pain. Your network, your Internet connection will be pain from all over the world daily, 24 by 7. There's, some of them could be harmless, but many of them could be just a way to see what can I do to knock on your door and see what they can open. So you want to make sure you have the, you know, at least an annual penetration test to see what people can see from the outside. With that, I'll turn it back to you, Emily, to go over the next polling question. Great. Thanks, Francis. Our next question is, on the topic of cybersecurity, has your company considered cybersecurity liability insurance? And your options are, we are considering it, we considered it, but opted out due to cost versus risk analysis. We have 
obtained it in an amount that would cover all potential costs. We obtained it in an amount to partially cover potential losses. Or we are not considering cybersecurity liability insurance. Give you all a few moments to submit your response. And as a reminder, for those of you who would like a copy of today's slide deck, you can download them from the folder that says Slide Deck at the bottom of your screen. We will also be sending the slides via email after the webcast. And let's take a look at the results. So about 30% say we are considering it. 8% we considered it but opted out due to cost versus risk analysis. 13% have obtained it in an amount that would cover all potential costs. 13% obtained it in an amount to partially cover potential losses. And 37% say we are not considering cybersecurity liability insurance. Francis, I'll turn it back over to you. Great. Wow, that's uh, amazing. So a lot of folks are still considering uh, cybersecurity insurance here. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Darren, to go. Oh, oops. Uh, oh, one more slide here. Um, on the technical consideration, so some of these things that you may not be understand what I'm talking about here, but in the IT world, so these are the main things in terms of the IT solutions. So architecture is a very big, very big thing for us. Uh, make sure you have these, um, I would call it segmentation, to make sure you have rooms, different rooms to house different kind of information so that even if you have a breach, your entire company may not be exposed. So that's a big thing. So architecture-wise, you have to make sure you have an architecture that enhances you know, security and make sure that uh, you, you pretty much uh, quarantine if you have a breach. Data type-wise, you have to make sure you have a data classification policy. If you don't, you may want to consider that because you may touch on different kind of data. It could be, it could be uh, um, something that, hey, this is not a big deal, financial information, maybe a financial reporting. You put it in one accounting group, and then you have hot data. You have a different segment. So you want to make sure you have a classification of the data in case something happens. Uh, secure input and output manager. You have to make sure that you establish safe and secure tunnels between terminals and peripherals. So many of you are using POS systems that are provided by third parties. And hopefully these third parties are using the right encryption methodology or um, method, uh, not some of the older ones that are already known to be exploitable. Point-to-point uh, -point encryption or two-factor authentication. So you make sure you want to secure all these ways of different input and output. And similar to the, the third one here, transmission encryption. Um, data encryption between terminals and devices. Make sure all these things are secure using the latest and greatest uh, transmission processes, sessions. On a web browser, we already know that the old ways of doing things, SSL, secure socket layer, maybe a term that you don't know what I'm talking about, but it's a, a way to in, supposedly uh, secure a session between your customers and you. That is proven to be no longer safe. PCI has come out, hey, this is not acceptable. If you're complying with PCI, you cannot use SSL anymore. You have to use something called transport, transport layer security, TLS. So that's something that's evolving every uh, every year, basically. So in the PCI world, they have gone from version two to version three to version 3.1 in a span of about two and a half years. Why? Because people are finding ways to defeat certain areas. So every so often they have to come up with updates to make sure that they close the loop, make sure people are doing the right thing, not only to comply with it, but looking at the real security, the 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 imminent danger that people are actually looking to get into an environment to steal their key information, right? So with that, I will turn it over to you, Darren, to talk about omnichannel customer experience. Thanks, Francis. Um, you know, as we get into the omnichannel, before, before there was the omnichannel, I always thought it was pretty easy to target your customers. There was basically two types of customers. There's what I call myself, which is a hunter. I go to the store because I know exactly what I want to get and I get out as quick as I can. 
or you had the shopper, which is my wife, who would go and look around at different things and hopefully at some point for retailers would buy something and not just shop. And what's happened with Omnichannel is that continuum, you know, with me on one side and my wife on the other, has come closer together. Um, my wife does a lot more browsing or shopping online now and may still make may make purchases in the store or may purchases online, but her browsing or her shopping is done online. And now I'll check stuff online before I even make the the effort to go to a store. And so the point of that is, as you can see on this slide, is customers don't want targeted marketing anymore. It's not, I know exactly who my target market is. It's, where are you meeting me along the continuum? Where am I gaining access? You know, we talk about people being time starved. People still have time on their hands. They're just multitasking. So they're sitting watching a TV show and they're on a tablet browsing or shopping like my wife does. So omnichannel is a critical piece to what we believe retailers are trying to accomplish today and a way to reach the customer. And when you do that, it's got to be done right or you're not going to uh, please the customers. Um, I'll go through this really quick. Frank kind of touched on this earlier. You know, the purchase path is changing. We have you have Ropus, which is reserve it online and go in and buy it. You have Bopus to buy online and pick up in the store. And then you have buy online and ship to the customer, right, which most a lot of people do now. And a lot of people that are brick and mortar and e-commerce are starting to use their stores as their shipping points. Uh, so there's not central warehouses anymore. They're, they're shipping it from their specific locations to meet the customer faster to keep up with certain online company out there that can uh, do it in, in an hour or less in some areas. Um, the omni-channel experience obviously is the rise of the, of the customer. It's, when you look at it, it's really a branding opportunity because 60% of the customers want to know the inventory before they head to the store. Again, you're pushing that hunter on the continuum more to the center. Um, you know, the, the a great thing to do is if people are checking mobile devices in the store for price checks against your stuff and other people's stuff, you definitely want them going to your site and not other people's sites. And they say that the, that the people, and you've seen them probably in your stores, if they have mobile access, they're more likely to be satisfied, more likely to purchase again when they get all the information. Uh, real quick. I'm just going to talk about the changing role of associates. Um, the associates that just would stand in stock shelves and you would have to go hunt them out is not doing you any favors anymore. They've got to be engaged. They've got to know the product. They have to reference, you know, the product on a, on a tablet if they don't know the information. But they have to be happy. They have to like their job. They have to draw people into wanting to buy stuff. Otherwise, Everything that you're trying to do brick and mortar, you might as well do online. Because the brick and mortar purchases are more likely emotional, and the, the e-commerce purchases are most likely transactional. So the more you can cater to people's emotions, the better. Um, again, the omni-channel experience, it's personalization. It's a seamless experience, so all these bullet points I can walk through and talk through, but basically what you want to do is somehow, how do we have an app on the mobile side that will enhance our customer's experience, that will be additive to them being in the brick-and-mortar store, or perhaps pull them or push them to the store. Um, the mobile apps are a lot of times being used for education. How do you use the product? Product reviews, I mean, you have the Yelps of the world and everything else that People want to know what other people are saying. They don't necessarily want to know, depending on the product, there's some products where they want the technical expertise, but a lot of times they're being pushed and pulled based on consumers' feedback, so consumers' reports. I know I'm flying through this quick. I'm trying to make up a little bit of time, so if you have any questions, feel free to ping them on the, the Q&A board. Um, the digital influence on the shopping experience. Here's some stats for you, 84% 80 use digital before shopping. 
22% spend more using digital. So once they're on it, is that app or is that website more likely to generate more revenue? And the, the stats show that there's 22% more spending using digital. 75% say that social channels influence loyalty. So again, not looking so much to expertise on subject matter, but looking more to customer feedback. So the keys to leveraging detail is one strategy doesn't fit all, right? There's specialty stores that are different than mass, that's different than grocery, that's different from apparel, right? They're all different and it's about understanding your customer and where you can meet them where they're at. It's got to be a seamless experience. The experience in brick and mortar and the experience on e-commerce have to be the same. They cannot have different prices. They need to have the same feel, the same brand. Um, better, not more function, functionality. So the quicker someone can search something and buy something, the better. More clicks means less purchases. Um, and stop trying to sell. Just provide the image and information and customers will start to buy. Customers are looking more and more for information these days than ever. So my last slide before we get to a quick polling question is, what? there's a lot of words on this slide. What, is, what it's saying is, what's the experience? What experience are you giving the customers? The customers need to want to go to the store. They need to desire to be in there. Is it the emotional connection to the associates, is it um, the layout of the store to where it's a place where they can, they feel safe, comfortable, can hang out, it's, it's got a good vibe to it. They already have the, the store in their pocket, so there's got to be something to pull them in uh, to the brick and mortar. So again, the pull in is what's the experience of that brick and mortar store plus what's the digital integration that's going to get me the information that I need. Um, brick and mortar is an important piece of the purchase equation. Um, you know, you see Amazon coming up with retail stores now. Um, the more your associates can understand and guide people, um, the better it is. So with that, I'm going to turn it over real quick from a specific brick and mortar question. And Emily, if you'd walk us through that, that'd be great. All right. Our final polling question is, how has the recent change to the minimum wage laws impacted your business? And your options are not at all, somewhat, significantly, causing me to plan relocation at least term, or causing me to find a way out of my lease now. I'll give everyone a few moments to respond. And once you have completed all CPE requirements, you will be able to download a PDF of your CPE certificate from the certification icon at the bottom of your screen. I'll give everyone a few more seconds. And let's take a look at the results here. So 52% say not at all, 43% say somewhat, 4% say significantly, and no one is um, planning a relocation or finding a way out of their lease now. Yeah, interesting, uh, interesting responses. I know we have some uh, people uh, on this on this call that aren't brick and mortar or may not have locations that just had increases to minimum wage. So not surprised at the results. Um, <clears throat> at the same point, uh, you know, there's there's big pushes in, in pockets um, around the country to up the, the minimum wage, and um, it may or may not have an impact depending on how you pay your associates. Um, we did have one other question that was online, and, and, and it was more of a comment that says it seems like e-commerce is more like another business, and, and I would encourage um, people to think as e of e-commerce, or at least digital, um, the digital digital impression as an additive to a brick and mortar, if you're brick and mortar only. Um, I think that as as we continue down this continuum, of this omni-channel presence, the the lack of a digital presence will have a direct effect on your brand and your ability to reach your customers. So I will go on to one other topic that we're completely shifting gears on, and that's global expansion. Uh, those of you who have participated in this call before know that this is a topic that we cover every year. Um, and basically, it's the do's and don'ts of, of global expansion. Uh, it, 
you know, one of the, the key thing is whatever's working in, let's say, the U.S. and you want to take it to Europe or South America or somewhere else, what works here does not necessarily mean it's going to work there. Um, so there needs to be a lot of time spent understanding the local market and culture, um, trying to figure out where is the complementary market, uh, the brand integrity, knowing the economic and regulatory factors. The, one of the biggest things is a lot of a lot of teams usually take their A team that that is high performing in the U.S. and they stick them in this other jurisdiction, um, and their core market starts to backslide. So be careful on taking the A-team because you know you want to make a huge dive into this new market. Be careful what you have replacing them in your core market. So the key learnings is tailor the message to the market, have a holistic cross-functional plan, focus on people and talent, and, and at times the partner network. You know, is there someone we can leverage that knows the market better than we do? And then test, measure, refine, test, measure, refine again. So I'm going to turn it over with that. I'm going to turn it over to Frank to talk about some of the retail marketing strategies and uh, to give you some insights on that. Thanks, Darren. Great job. A uh, couple things I want to mention before we get into the last uh, two sections, and really that we have received some questions and we're going to address those at the end. However, if you have uh, or want to have a more extended dialogue or just don't want to have it, uh, your, your questions discussed publicly, you know, you'll have our contact info and you can reach out to us and we'd be happy to accommodate that. Also, uh, Moss Adams has formed something we call MARC, which is Moss Adams Retail Connection. And what that is is it's a group of uh, retail CFOs up and down the West Coast that meet in, in small groups, uh, I think we have three. We have one in Southern California, one in Northern California, one from the Northwest that get together and exchange just operational ideas. If there is a specific topic, uh, we can certainly present on that or just provide a venue where you can communicate with others. As you can tell from what we're doing today and what we continue to try to do is to deliver what we like to call the Moss Adams Advantage, which is providing insight and information to our, our clients and companies that we come in contact with. So with that, I'll jump into the retail marketing strategies. And as Darren mentioned, there is not one that fits everybody, but you can look through these. And, and the drivers really are, how are you going to engage with the customer? And, and I think in terms of time, in two factors. One, the customer does not have uh, a lot of time. They're multitasking. And two, your challenge as a retailer is the more time you spend with them, the the more sales are going to grow. So uh, without going through all of these, I think if you just keep that in mind, you know, you're trying to do things that have connectivity, whether it's, you know, people that uh, identify you because of your corporate res social responsibility or you're just first on their search engine as they pop up. Somehow you got to keep that connection. And these are various methods have been employed. Where we see very sure where things are going is if you if you look at some of the leaders, and again, Target we're calling out here, uh, that if they happen, you know, their customer happens to be somewhere with their phone, which is pretty much 24-7, and they see an ad in a magazine, quick picture, they snap it, and they can find it directly on, on Target. It's it's incredible app. Um, by, we talked a lot about making it convenient. So I'm a little surprised. I think it was about 18% that aren't doing the e-commerce business. Uh, but I would think uh, some of these concepts really are things that are going to be all-inclusive. So you might want to find a way to move in that direction. Convenience is another factor. Uh, Bloomingdale's, I think, started this with the iPads in the dressing rooms. And I think Rebecca Minkoff is taking it to a whole nother level where uh, basically, the, the dressing room iPad will communicate with the associate on the floor, and they'll run around and get you stuff so you don't even have to come out of the dressing room if you want to shop for different product. Another way to engage in the customer is to have something else that keeps them in the store, uh, a la you know, the coffee shop and the bookstores. 
some kind of social engagement where it's not necessarily that they're there to buy your product. They might be hanging out with friends, but they're comfortable in that environment. Of course, then they'll they'll bring um, you know more sales dollars to you. Again, like the next point, it's about experiences, not products. And if you can make people feel special, some kind of customization that wins. And uh, I guess lastly, the, this concept of you and it's been mentioned before if you if you're bricks and mortar focused you have to have something that draws your customer into the store but there will be or there currently is a place anywhere you're at you know you could be on the top of a mountain you could be in a restroom you can buy product anywhere so the mobile applications need to be up to speed so uh, with with that, I think maybe um, Emily, you can share with us a couple questions that we received, and we can address those. All right. And as a reminder, if you would like to ask a question today, please submit your question in the Q and A box. Our first question is: Won't EMV just push the fraud to e-commerce? That's a good question. This is Francis here. So as I mentioned before, with the EMV chip uh, rollout, it makes it harder for the hackers to clone the cards. However, that's not going to be forever. So for the time being, I would think that uh, the answer is maybe yes. People are not going to be able to clone the cards. They're not going to be able to make these uh, phony cards and walk up to stores to buy stuff as much as possible, as much as before. But that will probably push them to go to probably where they can find the cards aggregate, such as payment processors or maybe some of the bigger stores where, hey, I, if I can find a way to install some uh, malware to trap these cards at the POS, for example, at Target, that would be great because they can still use the card numbers to, for example, to, uh, to, to, get, to buy uh, whatever they want to buy with a card not present transaction, or they can sell the card information online for it, I don't know, anywhere from 5 to $30 a pop. So that could be very profitable. But then, of course, uh, the EMV chip is not going to be forever unbeatable. So probably it's just going to be a matter of time. You know, they find a way to beat that system and clone the cards. So that will come back to the old system, and, of course, uh, the, the brands will find another way to secure that. So it's almost like a chess match. You find a way, I find a way to get around it, and then go back and forth like that. But for the time being, yeah, that probably will push the fraud, fraud to more cart not present transactions to more e-commerce side. Great. Thank you, Francis. Our next question is, what's the future for one-store brick-and-mortar stores? I do just over $1 million per year. I'm considering a second location and have been in business for 15 years. Uh, this is Frank. I, I can address that. I think um, a, a couple of things. One, there's the fact that you've been in business for 15 years tell, tells me obviously you're doing something right. So you got to look at that formula, and you move to another store. Uh, you know, you want to replicate not just what the store is um, selling, but also the demographics. So there might be some very unique things about the spot you're in, and uh, I would caution you to, to make sure spot number two is has equally unique characteristics, whether it's the demographics of the income stream of people there. I don't know. It could be a resort location. When, when you um, move into many more locations, then I think the biggest challenge is really systems. So the, the system side of, of things is not cheap, and uh, it gets um, leveraged over 50 or 100 stores easily. When you go be beyond two or three, you find that you need to probably get to 10 quickly uh, for the, the additional cost to kind of be absorbable. So uh, that's, that's what I would think on, on a one-item store now. I think there's also a related question from this person, Emily. Is that right? Um, so the follow-up is, I have an online presence, but I just don't sell online. Okay. And so, yeah, I'd, I'd love to have that dialogue. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if um, 
if, if if you are not selling online, I'm not. I would think it's more of a functionality challenge uh, than a conceptual challenge as to why you wouldn't want to be there. Uh, I would I'd encourage you to go that way. I, I do believe that if you have talented sales associates, when people come into the store, they can do a great job to drive business up. Uh, and so sometimes it is challenging on the website to make that same kind of impact, uh, but I, I would encourage you to go in that direction. Great, and I think that's all we have time for today. Thank you, Frank, Francis, and Darren for a great presentation. As a reminder, if you attended today's presentation in a group and would like to receive CPE credit, you must complete the group attendance sheet in order to receive credit. If you participated as an individual and met all certification requirements, your certificate is available to download now in the CPE icon at the bottom of your screen. Open the icon and click the printer icon in the lower right corner to download a PDF copy of your certificate. I'll keep the webcast console open for a few minutes to give you time to download your certificate now. A copy of your CPE certificate will be emailed within two weeks should you have any difficulty downloading it now. Here's a link to an online survey where you can provide feedback for today's presentation. Please take a moment to complete this survey as your feedback is very important to us. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope you'll join us again next time.